Okay, first of all, um, I'm going to uh, start off by explaining, well, as you know, faces are incredibly important to us. They're very, very important social cues. So, if you were to describe somebody, you wouldn't typically describe, well, their body. You'd describe what their face looked like. Uh, and similarly, when we think about, well, make choice, people's faces are incredibly important to us. Thank you. So... Um, there are many different ways in which faces differ. Uh, many different things have been studied about uh, in terms of facial attractiveness. It's been sort of systemized. Uh, so over here, well, we've got masculinity, uh, age, uh, personality. And the most subtle thing over here is what I'm going to talk about. So over here, differences between these two faces, probably you can't work out what they are. One face is actually more symmetrical than another, and I'm going to talk about symmetry and attractiveness. So why, why talk about symmetry? There are many cues. So, I don't know, I've got a beard, and looking around, I, I can see yeah, a few males uh, with beards. If we went back 10 years ago, then probably there wouldn't be any of you with beards at all, maybe one or two. Now, it's in style. Uh, it's something which is part of our culture. It is something which, yes, other people find attractive. Um, ten years from now, who knows what happens? No one might have beards again. Or alternatively, I don't know, there might be testosterone creams and going out in a cold night. Both genders may be able to enjoy, well, an additional sort of fleecy layer on their face. Anyway, why, why, why look at symmetry in particular? It may be something which is not only important to us as a generation and possibly to our grandparents in terms of selecting a mate, but way back in our evolutionary past. The idea about... Uh, sorry. Uh, the idea being is that it may be a cue to health. Uh, and it may be a cue to there being a good genes. Basically, the rationale for this is that it, uh, asymmetries result from an organism not being able to develop smoothly. Uh, and these uh, causes, they may be things in the environment, may be environmental stressors, they may be genetic variation, if you like, abnormalities. So do these things actually cause individuals to be less symmetrical? Is, is symmetry actually uh, a good cue? In terms of other animals, um, there's been many, many studies. Uh, for instance, if you take uh, birds um, and if you deforest their environment, you, you cause them stress in terms of environment, then after, well, next generation, you'll find that the individuals are more asymmetrical. Uh, if you take uh, individuals and, uh, who are naturally parasitized, they actually have parasites, you fumigate them, then the next generation will be more symmetrical as a result of not having this parasitism. Um, if on the other hand, uh, you say take Australian rats and uh, you interbreed them generation after generation, they'll become more asymmetrical. There's a whole lot of sort of similar evidence to this. Uh, in humans as well, there's similar evidence to this. Uh, in ter so, symmetry is actually quite a good cue to an individual being healthy, to an individual having good genes as well. What are the effects of symmetry in terms of judgments about attractiveness and in terms of actually what people do and what other animals do? In terms of other animals, uh, other animals, yes, there's clear evidence that they prefer symmetry. Uh, if you can, well, you can set up studies. I'm going to talk a little bit more about humans. In terms of humans, individuals, individual males who are more symmetrical uh, tend to have sex earlier in their life. Uh, they tend to be more preferred uh, on a whole lot of sort of measures. Uh, Females as well. Uh, females tend to be more preferred. They tend to have more children. So you might put, well, these two things together and think, well, that suggests that symmetry is a good cue. It's a cue which is used. And 
So next thing would be really to think about, well, look at mechanism, say, a missile bird's head, which would detect symmetry. Uh, and so is that going too fast? Well, we've got evidence, good evidence, that genetic environmental stresses do cause asymmetries. However, we have the problem that also genetic environmental stresses also affect other traits. So if this little bird's looking for a mate, then we can't tell whether they're looking at the asymmetries or whether it might be that they're looking at another trait. Say a more healthy individual is, well, the more likely to be symmetrical. They're also likely to have plumage, which is uh, a better color, brighter colored, and things like that, in better order and other things. So we can't tell by these sorts of studies that I've been talking about whether actually symmetry is uh, in fact used or whether something else is noted. We need to do manipulation studies. So, um, in terms of other animals, there's been many manipulation studies done. Typically, what is done in these manipulation studies is that animals made more asymmetrical. It's quite easy to do. You can imagine if you take a bird, then you can pull off feathers in an asymmetrical manner. And what is found is that bird is, well, less preferred as a mate than a, a, another individual who hasn't had this manipulation done to them. One very nice study by Swaddle and Cuttle um, looked at zebra finches, and what they did was they removed feathers, and basically what they found was if they removed feathers in a more symmetrical pattern, then they could remove more feathers and still the bird was more preferred than a bird who had less feathers removed from it, but in a less symmetrical pattern. In humans, we can't do this sort of study. But what we can do is use computer graphics. So, well, using myself as a, uh, a uh, stibios, early studies, um, they made perfectly symmetrical uh, versions. Um, and that what was found was that these perfectly symmetrical stimuli were actually less preferred. So what was suggested from that was, in fact, in humans, humans were for some reason different, that in humans, symmetry wasn't actually preferred. And I'll show you the reason for this. Okay. So this is myself and my younger, more beautiful self. And you can see if you mirror um, symmetrize me, uh, both of these are exactly symmetrical. But I think you'd agree that this is actually much more uh, attractive than either of these two over here. <laughs> Thank you. I quite like that my original self is more preferred. Anyway, you can see that there are abnormalities which have been in, induced in this process. Uh, so, well, the effect of this was, yes, we, we thought that there was something special about humans, that unlike other animals, we didn't prefer symmetry. Later processes, uh, more advanced computer graphics, well, basically you could do that with, with mirrors, really. Uh, more advanced computer graphics, instead, they used a process which is, well, was basically warping. And uh, what that allowed them to do, what I did, uh, was to manipulate faces in a way which is a bit like changing the bone structure to make it more symmetrical, and the, the cartilage. So, Still, the outside of the face, the skin, remains asymmetrical. And so, rather than getting something which is fully symmetrical, you find something like this. So, this face over here is more symmetrical. The difference is very subtle. And stimuli like these are more preferred. Uh, so, we, like other animals, prefer symmetry. You might think, game over. Time to look and see whether there's actually some symmetry detector or something like that. However, things are still actually a bit more complex than that. Does symmetry really matter? Uh, most natural asymmetries are actually very, very small. They're about 1% to 2% feature size. And if you say take, well, 
very nice study was done by Swaddle and Cuttle. Uh, they took starlings who have very good eyesight. They're very interested in patterns. They're highly patterned birds. These birds, actually, they weren't interested in these very small asymmetries. So in other animals, it seems, that real sort of wild asymmetries aren't particularly important. In humans, um, we would expect that in circumstances where we can't retrieve symmetry, if symmetry is important, when we can't retrieve it as a cue and can't, can't find it, then we would see faces in a much different, much different way. So taking my own face again, if we present whole faces, we can work out how symmetrical the face is. If we present part faces, we can't. And in these part faces, um, people's ability to rate the attractiveness of whole faces and part faces, it's very similar. Basically, people agree. There's a tiny, there's about 1% difference uh, in reliability. So symmetry doesn't seem to affect us terribly much. And this 1% is probably because there's just more information because you've got both sides of the face. So it seems that symmetry may not matter. Wild type asymmetries that are in the real may not matter terribly much to us or to other animals. Furthermore, symmetry is not just important to us and of interest to us in a context, well, in mating context, if you like, or in faces and other things which are other humans. It's important in architecture. Uh, many other man-made things, we tend to produce them and make them symmetrical. Uh, it's something that we enjoy in nature. That's nothing to do with mating or anything like that. It's nothing to do with mate choice. So why might symmetry be preferred? One explanation is that symmetrical objects are more like, well, they're more typical, and more typical, more prototypical objects are easier to process and therefore more preferred. This was suggested by Eric and Enquist. And they tested this. They took a neural net and trained it on asymmetrical crosses. So this neural net, if you like, had never seen a cross which was symmetrical. And then they tested it to see how well it responded, so how well it said that there was a cross there. Uh, and this is what they found. So up here, this is a response. And over here, this is amount of asymmetry. So further out is more asymmetrical. This is symmetry over here, and these are the stimuli which were trained at either side. And you can see this neural net, even though it was never actually trained with symmetrical stimuli, has, if you like, a preference for them. Okay, why the chicken over here? The, the neural net, it might be something which is specific to the way that they set up the neural net or something like that that they used. So instead they did a similar experiment with a chicken. Uh, in fact, a few chickens. They trained the chickens and they rewarded them with food if they pecked at crosses rather than pecking uh, at, if you like, a little bar. So a, an uncrossed bar. And these crosses were always asymmetrical. Sometimes they were asymmetrical one way, sometimes asymmetrical, asymmetrical the other way. Then, after training, the animals were tested. So they were presented with asymmetrical crosses, which they'd seen before and been rewarded for, and symmetrical crosses. And the animals have a preference for the symmetrical crosses. So without actually experiencing things which are symmetrical, we seem to, or other animals, and probably us as well, have a preference, a natural preference for symmetry. So where does this leave us? It suggests that we don't actually need any special system any evolved adaptation to prefer symmetry. Probably, yes, it may be important in mate selection, but it's not something, even though it's a cue which could be used and a cue which you would expect to be valuable, that is used uh, by us and similarly quite probably by other animals. Anyway, so thank you very much. Um, I'd also, well, most of this work was done uh, with uh, other collaborators, uh, Tony Little, 
uh, Dave Parrott uh, and others. Okay, thank you.